An atmosphere of evil pervades all of Shakespeare's tragedies, but perhaps none to the same extent as Titus Andronicus, which is surely the Bard's most bloodthirsty and sickening play. A whopping nine characters are killed during the course of the play's proceedings, whilst body mutilations and rape further create an air of squalid evil and destruction. So what does Shakespeare have to say about evil in this lesser known tragedy? Stay tuned, you're watching Schofield on Shakespeare. Shakespeare reveals that evil acts, ironically, can be prompted by religious beliefs and can have devastating consequences. It is Act 1, Scene 1. The mighty Roman general Titus Andronicus has returned triumphantly from battle, albeit with the bodies of a whopping 21 dead sons killed in action. He brings with him captives from the enemy, Tamara, Queen of the Goths, and her three sons, Alabas, Demetrius and Chiron. Lucius, one of Titus's remaining sons, demands the proudest prisoner of the Goths that we may hew his limbs, and on a pile, Admanes Fratrum, sacrifice his flesh, that so the shadows be not unappeased, nor we disturbed with prodigies on earth. So in other words, a proud Goth must be savagely slaughtered in order for his dead brothers to rest in peace in the afterlife and to prevent ghostly threatening appearances on earth. This seems gruesome and primeval to both modern and Elizabethan audiences, brought up on a diet of New Testament Christian forgiveness and passivity, in which old-fashioned sacrificial fires and chopped up limbs have no part to play. Tamara's eldest son, Alabas, is duly chosen to die, prompting his mother to land on her knees with her other two sons and plead desperately for his life. She points out that Titus is already glorified in bringing back such illustrious prisoners and that her sons have only been doing what his sons did, valiant doings in their country's cause. However, her words and reason argument tragically are ignored. Alabas is taken away to be sacrificed, leaving Tamara and her sons to reflect on a post-war act of evil or alternatively a faithful adherence to religious custom, depending on what side of the fence you're on. Chiron muses bitterly, was never Scythia half so barbarous. The captured Goths are in Rome, supposedly the hallmark of civilization. Yet Chiron's words show a belief that his people are more brutal, more heartless, more ruthless than even an ancient regime, north of the Black Sea known for its savagery. Demetrius feels suitably outraged and vows revenge for both the death of their brother and the humiliation of their mother. And my goodness, do the three take revenge, resulting in further deaths and unspeakable violence. Titus's initial well-meaning act of evil in insisting upon Alabas' sacrifice sets off a chain of deepening wickedness that only ends with the death of virtually all the main characters in the play. Titus is a glorious warrior who has served Rome as a soldier for many years. In Julie Tamer's 1999 film adaptation of the play, Titus is played by Anthony Hopkins, probably most well known for his portrayal of the psychopath Dr. Hannibal Lecter in the film The Silence of the Lambs. Hopkins' Titus enters still covered in filth from his many battles and is able to command complete silence and awe from the watching soldiers, with his authority highlighted further by the director's use of intimidating low angle shots. Titus, the glorious warrior, reveals that his youth was spent in dangerous wars whilst others securely slept. The man is highly respected in Rome, so much so he is urged to put himself up to be elected as emperor. His brother Marcus formally asks, 
Be candid artists then, and put it on, and help to set a head on headless Rome. Yet Shakespeare shows that such a respected figure is not only capable of planned acts of well-meaning evil, as in calling for the death of Alabas, but impulsive, impetuous ones too. Titus has supported Saturnius' emperorship and agreed for his daughter Lavinia to marry him. However, the problem is that Lavinia is already engaged to Bassianus, Saturnius' brother. Bassianus duly whisks his loved one away from Saturnius, causing outrage to both Titus and the new emperor. And so Titus decides to go after the amorous pair, until he is blocked by his own son, Mutius, who tells him, My lord, you pass not here. Titus's response is impulsive and conclusive. He roars indignantly, What, villain boy, pass me my way in Rome? before taking out his sword and killing him. Proud father figures are common in Shakespeare, men of seniority who expect younger family members to obey them without question and become furious when they don't. In Romeo and Juliet, for example, Capulet is outraged by Tybalt's continued desire to eject Romeo from their feast against his wishes and cries, What, Goodman boy, I say he shall, go to! The phrase Goodman boy is deeply sarcastic and mocks Tybalt's presumptuous behaviour as a younger man trying to give an older man instructions. Likewise in King Lear, Lear is shocked by his daughter Cordelia's refusal to publicly declare her love for him in the right pernickety way and swears melodramatically, by the sacred radiance of the sun, the mysteries of Hecate, here I disclaim all my paternal care. His outrage is shown in his reference to Hecate, the invisible goddess of the night, thus ludicrously catapulting a mere disagreement between father and daughter into the sphere of the gods and other planets. So Capulet rants and raves, Lear disowns, but crucially in neither case does their anger turn to murder. And so Titus's impulsive act of evil in killing Mutius is both shocking and unusual, dents his authority in Rome and causes conflict between himself and his own sons. Ironically, by attempting to show his own authority, he has only weakened it as his other sons reproach him bitterly. Lucius bluntly tells him, My lord, you are unjust. In wrongful quarrel you have slain your son. The key word is quarrel. This death is not to ensure the dead rest easy in the afterlife, but is merely over a petty argument of Mutius sticking up for his sister. The viewer at this point may also speculate as to whether such a legendary fighter in warfare has been able to mould his behaviour to the more sedentary, passive demands of civilian life, and conclude that he is not. Nonetheless, Shakespeare shows that acts of evil can take place in the blink of an eye, prompted by pride and a misguided determination for seniority to be respected, whatever the horrendous cost may be. In Tamor's film, Titus' impulsive act is accompanied aptly by frantic strings and a crescendo in brass, as Rome's darling commits the act that will have such appalling consequences later on. My lord, you pass not here. What? Then? Boy, pass me my way in Rome, huh? Help! For the repercussions of this act of evil are seen soon after in Act 2. Tamara's two sons, Demetrius and Chiron, with thoughts of Alabas' death and their own humiliating entrance as captives into Rome, fresh in their minds, have taken a liking to the Roman general's daughter, Lavinia. With the help of another, they ensnare Bassianus and Lavinia and quickly kill the former, leaving them free to an attempt an appalling open-air rape on the latter. In response to his mother's desire to quickly kill Lavinia, Demetrius replies, Stay, madam. Here is more belongs to her. First fresh the corn, then after burn the straw. The imagery is heinous. Lavinia is referred to not as an honourable living human being, but as an agricultural product to be eaten, corn, food which needs to be metaphorically freshed, to be beaten or literally raped before being killed or burnt as mere useless remains. The pair's evil is shown not just in their plain to rape, but also in the way they egg each other on through their soiled language. 
Chiron goes one step further than his brother when he suggests drag hence her husband to some secret hole and make his dead trunk pillow to our lust. In other words, the rape of Lavinia should take place with her dead husband's body beneath them. A humiliating, sick reminder of their own cruel murder and a further sign that not one is needed that their sexual desires are nauseating. Part of Lavinia's appeal is that she is a paradigm of virtue, like any good Roman or Elizabethan young woman, the daughter of a warrior and the first chosen wife for the emperor. In the moments before the rape takes place off stage, Chiron taunts Lavinia about her virtue, her modesty, her zealous guarding of her virginity. Come, mistress, now perforce we will enjoy that nice preserved honesty of yours. The phrase nice preserved honesty is mocking in tone and refers to the way Lavinia has fanatically lived up to archaic expectations about non-married women needing to remain virgins in order to have a value in society. It is clear that the opportunity to shatter, harm, destroy such a perfect model of propriety and virtue makes Lavinia a hugely attractive proposition to both Chiron and Demetrius. In fact, they are more sexually attracted to her because of it. Lavinia desperately tries to appeal to Tamara, a fellow woman, for help, even to be killed rather than suffer the ignominy of rape, but to no avail. Demetrius, possibly worried about losing his once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, tells his mother, Listen, fair madam, let it be your glory to see her tears, but be your heart to them as unrelenting flint to drops of rain. His urgency and desire for Lavinia is seen in his advisory imperatives, Listen, fair madam, be your heart. He describes drops of rain as light insignificance, like the tears that Lavinia is desperately shedding and cannot erode or have any effect on a hard, grey rock-like flint. And so this simile shows a cruel determination that compassion and emotion are blocked out and that Lavinia is not spared, that Lavinia is given up to their evil, lustful desires. She is. And so Titus's initial failure to show compassion or tenderness results in the diffusion of evil. Fueled by raging feelings of injustice, when Alabas is led away, Demetrius hopes that the selfsame gods that armed the Queen of Troy with opportunity of sharp revenge may favour Tamora. Two young men compound the atmosphere of immorality in the play by joyously raping the daughter of the man who vowed that their brother must be chopped up and sacrificed and show no remorse whatsoever. In Jonathan Bates's celebrated work, The Genius of Shakespeare, he refers to Shakespeare's fascination with the fragility of the body as a whole thing. And this is clearly seen in Act Two, Scene Four, when the audience learn that the pair have also chopped off Lavinia's hands and tongue in order that she isn't able to blab the truth about their hateful crime. Their taunting increases in intensity both are shameless in their challenging of the crime victim. So now go tell, and if thy tongue can speak, who t'was that cut thy tongue and ravished thee? Demetrius's words remarkably remind Lavinia, not that she needs reminding, of course, of two-thirds of their depraved acts. Ravished refers to the rape that would arguably be even more devastating to either a Roman or an Elizabethan woman due to the lack of opportunities to females beyond marriage, whilst the repetition of tongue highlights the fact that she will never be able to speak again. Chiron is also brutal in his acidic comments, and twere my cause, I should go hang myself. He is saying he would prefer to die rather than live in Lavinia's deformed state. Yet, of course, Lavinia does not have the means to hang herself anyway, as she doesn't have any hands. Their taunting is particularly nauseating in Tamer's film, with the boys bare-chested and dirty from their open-air attack, their voices shrill and childish, their body language creepily and almost homosexually touchy-feely, whilst Lavinia looks on in blood-stained, innocent white. She has no tongue to call, no hands to wash, and so, and so, let's leave it to a silent walks. And for at my case, I should go hang myself. If thou hadst hands to help thee knit the cord. <laughs>